So what, we, what I want to do with you before we just get into, go into God's Word this morning is just share with you a, just very briefly one, a very important aspect of, of my role as I serve you at the, at the conference and what that is. I'm, one of my roles is, is as the Director for Plan Giving and Trust Services, and um, I want to remind you that everything that we own is not ours. Amen? Everything that we own is a gift that God has given us. And as we look at the Bible, one of the things that, that is very clear throughout the Bible, it doesn't matter whether you, whether you start in the Old Testament or the New, you're going to see a constant theme all the way through the Bible with this message. And the message is God owns everything, and the reason that God owns everything is because He is the Creator. Amen? Amen? It, God created us. And, and so everything that we have, you know, sometimes we say, but, but Pastor, what about I, I, I'm the guy who made my own wealth. No, unfortunately, that's not the biblical principle, amen? The biblical principle is that God gave us the skills and the knowledge, and we've put them into practice, and then He's blessed us with the wealth that we have received, amen? And no, notice this uh, passage, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 14. I love this because this so hits where most of us are, amen? I know there are times when I have said these words myself. But uh, who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Isn't that beautiful? As they were building the temple, they recognized that everything that they were giving at that particular point in time was a gift that had come from God. And so, friends, as we look at our wealth, as we look at the assets that God has provided with, we see the same thing. We see how God has, has blessed us in so many ways. So God is the owner. He's um, given us the opportunity to be stewards. We're responsible. He's responsible for our success. And lastly, God holds you and me responsible, very importantly, for what we do with His property. Did you hear what I said? We're responsible for what He has given to us. And so I want to thank you from the Plan Giving and Trust Services Department, because over the past um, five years, we've seen close to a million dollars worth of bequests that have specifically come through the conference where people have made in advance of their demise, of their death, they have made plans um, to take care of their family, and as part of those plans, they've also taken care of the Lord's work. And so, I, I want to say thank you because behind every dollar bequest, there is also the grief of the family that experienced that loss. But the memorial that was left behind by that person has enabled our church, whether that was the conference or our local churches or our schools, to continue the ministry that God has called us to. Amen? And so I want to ask you a question. As you're thinking about how you you support the Lord's work. What are the areas of, uh, that interest you? Now, we, we kind of promote five key areas from a conference, and those mirror often what is happening in a local church. There's education, there's youth, there's young adults, there's the building itself. Um, and then, we, from a conference perspective, we have the HVA and Mount Etna as facilities that we provide to the conference, that all the churches, that are, are there as a support system, but at a cost. To, to the conference. So these are things that we're promoting, but we know that you have different ministries in your local church that you want to promote too, amen? We want to help you to ensure that as you're thinking about your estate plans, that you're thinking, how do I take care of the, the what I want to support, what I see God leading me to support in these different types of areas. Now, here's the, here's the issue. Some people say, but pastor, I can die in test date, and then the government will sort it out. Well, I don't really like that mode of operation, amen? The, I don't like the idea that government is going to tell my estate how I, how, how, how I want to see my assets divided because I'm responsible for them, amen? So here's the, the simple way. We create an estate plan, and your estate plan directs how you want to leave your assets to your family and friends, to the charity like the church, and minimizes the portion that goes to the government, Amen? We can never run away from our taxes, but we have to take care of our responsibilities. So I, I want to invite you to fill in one of the cards and, um, that have been handed out this morning, 
uh, don't, don't, they won't be brought back in um, until afterwards. Hand, I'll be standing at the back of the church as, as you're leaving. You're welcome to give them to me. And we'd love to reach out to you. We'd love to support you. We'd love to help you and assist you. This is a, a free service to you, and we'd love to, to be able to, uh, to be there for you. Can I hear an amen? God bless you. So let's, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer as we once again invite the Lord's presence um, into this place and into our hearts and our minds as we open his word. Father, this morning as we open your word, we are mindful that this is your Sabbath day, that you are the Lord, you're the God, you're the creator. And because of your love and your grace for us, you have given us an opportunity, Lord, to, to come to you and to worship you as God, as Lord, as King, but also, Lord, as our Redeemer because of our sin and the one who will restore us on the day that you come back. So, Lord, we invite your presence, not just here in this place, but in our hearts and our minds. Lord, as we worship you, we know that we're unworthy. But, Father, we pray that every word, every thought, every deed, every action, every thought will be one that reflects your love and your grace. And, Lord, as we look to you, we invite you to do great things, not just here in our hearts and our minds, but, Lord, as you inspire us to serve you, Father, we pray that it will be done for your honor and glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I love living in this area. I've lived in different parts of the United States. And I must tell you that I love living in the United States. I, 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 I've, I'm not trying to be patriotic this morning. I just want to tell you that America has some amazing things. And one of the amazing things coming from where I was working before in the Southwest, one of the amazing things that America has in the Southwest are the massive grand national parks. When you go to places like Yosemite and the Grand Canyon, there is nothing like them. It's amazing. I remember the first time um, we went on a vacation and we, uh, together with my wife, and we went on this vacation, and we decided that we were going to visit about five or six of the national parks, and we were going to do it in a week. And I remember how much, how, just, the, just that sense of awe that I experienced as I was standing on the, on the rim of the Grand Canyon looking into this vast, amazing hole. And, and I can tell you that I'm, as you know, as you, as, as you get to know me, I'm a man of few words. And I, I don't normally have much to say about anything. And, and so that particular moment just ca encapsulated my entire way of, of my mode of operation. And I stood there for a good 10 minutes just looking at this hole without anything to say. I, 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 I was completely awestruck and dumbstruck by this event. It, it was amazing. If you have never been to the Grand Canyon, I encourage you to go to the Grand Canyon. But don't just stop there. Go to these other, these other parks, the arches and, and these other places, Yosemite, etc. They're, they're absolutely amazing. And so when I moved here to the East Coast, I was wondering, what, what, I, what would I experience? What would I see over here on the, on the East Coast? And as I'm, as I'm visiting different places, I get to see how this country developed and, and how, um, how, it, how it changed over time and, and the foundation of the country. But beyond that, one of the things that really is amazing to me is every time I go and visit Washington, D.C., because there we have the nation's assets together in the Smithsonian Museum. And not only the history but of, of how the country developed, but how society developed, not just here but all around the world, is covered and, and, and encapsulated in the different uh, museums that are there. And so you get to see history, but you get to see the pride, you get to see the ingenuity of this nation. This particular, one of the things that I enjoy, the places that I enjoy going to, I think is one of the museums that is least visited. In fact, when I go to this particular Smithsonian, it's the one that I watch people walking through very quickly. It's almost as if it sits in a block, and if it's raining, it's easy for somebody to step in through one door, walk through the hallway to save themselves getting wet, and walk out the other side. It's that kind of a situation. 
And, 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 and so, and, and so I, I, I walk down through the hallways and, and sit, stand on the walls are hanging the paintings, the portraits of, of different people. Now, it's one thing to go to the art galleries and see the, the paint, and sometimes I have to look at some of the art and, and I wonder really what was going on in that person's mind. <laughs> it's not me. But what I'm amazed at is when, I, when I'm looking at these portraits, is that you're looking at a representation of this particular person, who he was. You're not just reading about them in the history book. You're not just reading somebody's description of what they did. You're actually looking at their face, face to face. Now, I know it's not them. It's a representation of them. But as you look at that representation, you get to see just a little bit of who that person was or what they looked like and, and how they dressed and, and what, what, they, what maybe were behind the way that they, they, they lived and made their decisions. I wonder what portrait you have of God. Because every one of us has a different idea of who God is. Every one of us, as you look back in your life, as, as you have walked through your life, you have seen God walking with you at different phases in different ways. And if you grew up as Christian, you grew up in that Christian home, but even then you had to come to a point where going to church was not just something that was related to what your parents were doing, but it became your own decision because of your personal relationship with God. And, and sometimes in our personal relationships with God, as Seventh-day Adventists, we can be very academic. It's all about the truth and what we know, and we forget that it's about a personal relationship with Jesus because our relationship with Jesus is what saves us. And on the day of judgment, the question will be asked, do you know me? So it's important that we have a good idea of who God is. But I want to share with you that sometimes we take ideas from culture, we take ideas from the world, we take ideas from situations and events that have happened in our lives, and we use those events to color our image of who God is. Back in the days of the Greeks, they believed that the gods were up there in heaven and they were warring. And then earth, on earth, people were doing their thing, and every so often the gods would get involved in events in the earth, and it was never very good. Is that your image of God? I remember many years ago, many years ago when I was sitting in college, it was the first week of my undergrad, it was a great momentous week for me. I was so excited. And the lecturer asked the question, what's the difference between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament? And I was looking to earn some points. So I put my hand up and I used all my wisdom. And I said to him, I said, because he looked at me and he pointed in my direction. And, he, and I said to him, I said, the God of the Old Testament, that God, that God is a God of justice. And the God of the New Testament, that God is a God of love. Remember, Jesus came and died on the cross and paid the price for our sins. That God has a plan for my life and, and for yours. And I remember he looked at me in one of those knowing sorts of ways that teachers look at you. You know what I'm talking about, right? And I looked, he looked at me with that look that just said, I know I've got you for the next six years. <laughs> and then he said, he said, the theme of God's love is there throughout the Bible. And for the next six years, that's what he pointed out to me. And he showed me how God was consistent all the way through the pages of the Bible, but yet God's consistent love reached out to a sinful mankind who was completely chaotic and erratic. So who is your image of God? 
What does he look like to you? As you think back to your experiences, maybe your image of God is a good image of God, but maybe your image of God has been tempered by events and situations that have happened in your life. I want to share with you this morning that it's not fair to take your events and impose that on God. But it is fair to listen to who God is and to accept Him for who He portrays Himself to be. And so this morning, I want you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Luke, chapter 15. And you're going to say to me, Pastor, we have heard umpteen sermons on Luke chapter 15. And believe me, I'm with you because I have too. But this morning, I want you to walk with me, and as we walk through this passage, I want you to walk with me not from the perspective of your salvation, which is generally the way that people as preachers are, are portraying these passages. This is the way that they generally take the passage. I want you to walk with me through the passage and see how God demonstrates who He is. Are you ready to go with me? So let's look. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, and 3 and 4. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them, and sp so he spoke this parable to them, saying, now let's just stop there. So here's Jesus. It's this particular day Je that Luke is recording. Jesus is out there. He's ministering. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees come knocking at the door. Now, the reality was the Pharisees and the Sadducees regularly came knocking at the door. They were constantly trying to trip up Jesus. They were the religious elite. In fact, they were the religious elite, and they always had opposing views. If, if one of them said one thing, you could guarantee that the other one would say something completely different. That's the kind of situation that was going on. Not unlike what we see going on in our own environment, our own country today. Constant warring and battling between them. So here's what happens. They come to Jesus, and they ask Jesus, trying to trip him up, a, a, a question. Now, here's what I want you to understand about what they thought. They believed that they were the religious elite. They believed that they were guaranteed salvation. They believed that they were guaranteed salvation, but they also believed that everybody else who wasn't a Pharisee in the Sadducee was not going to be saved. In fact, they called everybody else, the, word they, the phrase they used was the people of the land. That was the phrase they called them. And then they had the Gentiles as another subgroup of people that absolutely had no chance of, be, of being saved. Because they believed that God had no interest in anybody other than, the, than them. And they were pure and holy simply because they were Pharisees and Sadducees. So why, in their mind, why would a God, a Messiah, why would Jesus come and mix with the low lives of society? Why would he hang out with the sinners when all he had to do was just focus his attention on them, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who were already holy and ready to go to heaven? Are you with me? There's a problem with this picture, right? So here's what Jesus does. Jesus speaks this parable to them. That's what Luke says. And notice how it starts in verse 4. It says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. 
Amen? Verse 6. And then he comes home and calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which I lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Can you imagine how mind-blowing this was? Here was Jesus giving, sharing this illustration about the, about the sheep how the shepherd would go after the one sheep, how the shepherd would take the 99 sheep back to the fold, and then they would go out and search the hillsides wherever they would have to go, however dangerous the situation, the environment was. That was where the shepherd would go. He would risk his life for the one sheep. Whether he owned the sheep or whether he was employed to look after the sheep by the village, he did the same thing. You see, friends, that is who God is. God is a God who loves us. God is a God who pursues us. God is a God who relentlessly values nothing more than you, your heart, surrendering it to Him. That's what God wants. He wants to walk with you. He wants to live with you. He wants to enjoy you. He wants you to enjoy Him. And He's willing to put His life on the line in order to win you back, to pay the price for your sins and draw you close to Him. That's who our God is. And that God was completely contrary to the God that these religious leaders were telling the people about. You see, the religious leaders were telling the people that God was not interested in them, that God had no interest in them, that they were completely unworthy. In fact, you remember I said that they were called, everybody else, you and I would be called the people of the land. You remember that? Well, actually, I would have been a Pharisee or a Sadducee. You guys would be people of the land. But you remember we said that? It was so bad that those people of the land, if one of their daughters married, if one of the daughters of the Pharisees or the Sadducees married one of the people of the land, they would all, the whole group of Pharisees and Sadducees would almost go into a state of mourning and they would say things like, it would be, have been better for her to have been eaten by a lion than for her to be married in this situation. Are you still with me? Now, here's the deal. Remember we talked about the the sinners? God is not in the business of discrimination. God is in the business of loving all of us. And all of us, at different points in our time and in our life, have carried out and committed different sins. Whether we're inside the church or outside of the church, there is no difference. All of us are sinners. All of us need the the righteousness of Jesus Christ to cleanse us of our sin. That's it. There is no other way to salvation. And that is what Jesus demonstrated by the cross because no matter who you were, no matter what your socioeconomic grouping is, Jesus loves you. You are his sheep, and he values you so much that he would go and die on the cross and pay the price for your sins. That's who God is. That's one portrait of Jesus. Let's look at the next one. The next one is found in verse 8 to 10. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp 
sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And, then she, and when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I have found the peace that I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So here's the second parable. The second parable is an interesting parable. I want you to, again, walk with me on the background to this story. So this woman, she would have, at some points during her childhood, she would have grown up with the idea that at some point she was going to get married. My daughter, when she was six, would sit in front of the TV watching the, 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 I think it's Lifetime shows on marriage, and she would be watching how the brides were getting dressed, etc. And it was amazing to me. She was talking about this at six. I told her no boyfriends until she's 50. <laughs> I kind of quashed that idea, but I think I'm losing. Her, her and her mama conspiring against me. I'm doomed. But I want you to think with me. So here was this woman. She would have been thinking about the, the, the possibility of getting married. Her parents her, her, and her, her would have created her dowry. Now, in Middle Eastern culture, the way that you demonstrate that you're married is that you have a gold headdress across your, your, the front of your forehead. And that, go that gold headdress, you've probably seen pictures of those gold headdresses, amen? Th those gold headdresses would have coins that would be hanging on them, and, and the part of the dowry would be the gold that would be given to the woman and would be that either she would earn, or de depending on the economic situation of the family, or the family would provide, but as a dowry then that would go with her to her new home. And if she was divorced, that dowry came back. Did you hear what I said? The dowry came back. So, what, how else it would be used is that, that when the, the, the couple, the family, were economically having good experiences, they would buy extra coins and they would attach them to the, the headdress. And when there was an economic problem in the family, maybe a famine in the country, maybe a, a situation where the husband had lost his job, whatever it is, they would use some of those coins that redeem it, get money, use it to live off. It was kind of like the savings account for the family. So here is this woman. She's a, a perfectly respectable woman. She's living in her home. And this particular day, the, one of these coins falls off. Now, when it falls off the headdress, it doesn't just go clink on the ground onto some carpet or a nice wood floor. She had dirt-packed floor. And, and so that coin would have fallen on the floor, and it would have very quickly, depending on how dusty the situation or how muddy it was, fallen into the dirt and got lost. It wasn't enough for her to just say, this coin is inconsequential, I, I can live without it. She knew that she needed to find the coin. This coin was very precious, very special to her. It represented so much more than just a piece of gold. There was all this background to this coin. It was unique and individual, and she knew that she had to find the coin. So she got down on her knees, and she dug in the dirt. And she ensured that whatever it took to find that coin, she was prepared to find it. And then when she found it, it says that she, she had a, a party. She called her friends together, and they celebrated this coin that had been lost and was now found. So sheep. Sheep nibble. Have you ever watched sheep? When I was growing up, my, my, my dad pastored in the Lake District in England, and I would, I would drive with him to church, and we would be driving down these roads through the, the, the Lake District of, of the England. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And you're driving along, there's all these green fields and the stone walls, and then you see the sheep wandering around. And sometimes they're inside a wall, and sometimes they're outside of the wall. 
And often they got outside the wall because they would nibble their way to the edge of whatever the protected area is, and, and then they would find a way through because the grass was greener on the other side of the fence. We sin that way, don't we? Sometimes we nibble our way out of the safe area of following Jesus. And then there are other times when we're like the coin, and we do things that are blatantly sin. We know it's sin. We know that whatever it is is not right, and we know that we're lost. In fact, we know that we're lost, and we know that we can't help ourselves. You see, friends, the sheep can kind of maybe wander back, but when you lose a coin, that coin is completely unable to find its way out of the dirt. Wherever it lands, whatever happens around it, because of its sin, that's where it ends up. And yet, God, you see, God isn't up there in heaven like the Greeks doing His thing. God is very much involved and engaged in this world, and He's engaged for your heart and for mine and for everybody that we know. That's who He loves. That's who He's drawing to Him. That's who He wants to find Him or to accept Him, and that's who He's searching for. And when He finds us, we have a sense of hope that we could not find anywhere else. So friends, God is love. Amen? God is ardently pursuing us. God values you, even when you're a sinner. In fact, Jesus didn't come to this world and say, hey world, when you stop sinning, then I'll come and save you. Or when you stop half sinning, then I'll come and save you. Jesus came to this world while we were yet sinners and died on the cross for us. Then we get into the third parable. And I know this one, so it's one of our favorites. Luke chapter 15. Amen? You still with me? Verse 11. Let's read it together. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a portion of the goods that falls to me. And so he divided, them among, he divided his among, a livelihood amongst them. This is a good plan giving story. Amen? This is my job. Praise the Lord. So here's what happened. Dad and two sons. In Jewish law, the two sons, the, the, the Jewish law for, for the estate was very simple. What they would do is they would um, d- um, div- add up how many kids there were in the family, and they would divide the, the assets by one extra portion. So if there were two kids, they would divide the assets into three. If there were 10 kids, they would divide the assets into 11. Amen? And what they would do is, the idea was the eldest child would always receive the extra portion because it was their job, their responsibility. If any of the other children, the other siblings, experienced economic issues at any point in the future, it was their it was their responsibility as the eldest child to be the one who would be responsible. They were the ones responsible for taking care of them, even after the parents had died. And so I want you to think about what has happened here. Here is the young man. He comes to his dad while his dad is still alive, and he asks his dad, 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 and and, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands this morning. I just want you to walk with me on what's happening. He says, Dad, I want my share of your estate. Not when you die, but right now, today. Here's what he's telling his dad. He's saying to his dad, Dad, I don't think you can manage your assets correctly. Not a good message, amen? He's also telling his dad, Dad, I don't really love you. And I can guarantee you, If you have done it, it, you weren't probably successful. But I can guarantee you that if you're now thinking about doing it, please don't. Don't have that conversation with your parents. Just 
wait. Amen? Because it's not going to be a good one. All right? Especially young people. Do not think, wow, Pastor Sean, he gave me this great idea. I'm going to have a chat with my parents when I get home. Don't do it, please. Because I know that if I did it with my parents, I would be violently clipped around the ear and sent on my way. It wouldn't be a discussion point beyond that. Amen? So, here's the young man. He has this conversation, and the father does what nobody, no human parent would actually do. He actually divides his estate. He gives him his share without any restriction. God loves us so much that He created us. He gives us a sense of will, and He hasn't placed any restrictions on it. And so then it says, in verse 17, uh, excuse me, hold a second, uh, sorry, in verse 13, a number of days thereafter, the younger son gathered together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions in prodigal living. So the young man not content with taking his share from his dad. He decides that he's going to go away. He gathers everything he's got. Off he goes. It's the days before GPS. It's the days of the maps. You remember the days of the maps, amen? You would go down to 7-Eleven. You would, you would get the local map. You would get the, buy the county map, and you'd have to buy the state or the country map. Amen? You remember how that worked? Before GPS? So that's what he did. He, he worked out dive exactly opposite where the father lived. That's where he was going to go. And when he gets there, he has a lot of friends because he has the most riotous time. In fact, the word in Greek that describes how he got rid of his possessions is the same word that Jesus uses to describe how the sower sowed the seed with no control, no regard, were completely um, at random, all these assets are being spread wherever they went, he wanted them to go at whatever point in time. That's what sin is like. And God knows you and me, and he gives us the opportunity, although he would rather us come to him, he gives us the opportunity to do our own it says in verse 14 that when he had um, spent everything, there was a famine, and so he goes to one of the citizens in that country. He goes to that citizen, and he says, I need a job, because nobody else, none of those friends that he had, took him in. The guy employs him. He sends him out to look after the swine. You think about the connection with, with being a Jew. But he doesn't even feed him, because notice in verse 16 it says, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. Friends, I have to tell you that that's what sin is. There is nothing in sin. It has nothing to offer. It leaves us completely empty. It leaves us broken. It leaves us um, physically, mentally, emotionally wrecked. And God has a plan that's much better. And so, notice what happens. In the next few verses, it says that his brain cells started to work together. He realized that his father was, had servants that he could go back to. If all he had to do was go and apologize, his father would at least employ him and make him like one of the servants. At least at that point, he would be better off than where he was right now. And so he gets up. Remember, I don't want to dwell on this because I want to get back to the father. He gets up and his stinking, smelling self walks home to meet his dad. And that's where the story gets really interesting. Because the dad wasn't unaware of his loss. From the day that the son left, the dad was waiting for him. He wasn't 
just sitting there thinking at the back of his mind, oh, I wonder where my son is. He spent time anxiously looking down the road, watching for the day that his son would come back. And that particular day, as he goes to whatever the spot is in his house, maybe it was a multi-story home and he had a view down the street, wherever it was, he goes to that point and now he looks. And as he sees this young man, this big draggled, stinking, smelling body coming over the brow of the hill, he recognizes his son. He recognizes him. And he runs down through the house out along the path, out through the gate, onto the street. He's pushing everybody that's there out of the way because he sees his son, and the only thing that he wants to do is reconnect himself with his son. And when he gets there, when he gets there to the son, he could have stood back with finger wagging, judging the son. But that's not what he does. He throws his arms around him, that stinking, smelly wretch. You get it, right? He covers him. All the man, his son, has time to utter are the words, basically, that say he was sorry for what he did. And the father is wrapping him with a cloak of righteousness that covers up his sins, that covers up that broken, stinky, smelly person. He puts a ring on his finger, the symbol of the authority of the Father. And then he has a shoes put on his feet that recognize that he once again was a free man. He was no longer a slave to sin. That's who our God is. Our God doesn't care who you are. He doesn't care what you have done. He doesn't care what your background is, whether this has been a one incident or whether it's been a plethora, a lifetime of issues. The bottom line is, He doesn't care. What He wants is for you to accept Him. And He's relentlessly pursuing you so that you see that His way is much better than anything that this world has to offer. And then he has a party. Friends, I can tell you that sometimes I've heard people tell me, Pastor, we shouldn't celebrate. We shouldn't give thanks. We shouldn't appreciate. Friends, that is who God is. We're in the celebration business. If you're in the judgment business, you're on the devil's side. Accuser of the brethren, friends, is the devil. We're in the restoration business. As God's people, we are in the business of restoring people. We're in the business of helping them to understand that we are just as broken. No matter whether we came to church in a shirt with a suit or not, we haven't covered up that brokenness of who we are. All we have done is allowed ourselves to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That is what is uniting us here in this place this morning. You know, friends, I wish that was the end of the story. Don't you? But remember, we were talking about the religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so this story, unfortunately, has a little bit of another twist. That elder brother has been out in the fields. He's been working. He's been doing his thing. He's been doing his rituals, whatever it was that he was expected to do. He was following every letter of every law that was, imp- that was laid down, but he wasn't doing it with a heart of a joy or gratitude. And he comes home that day at the end of a busy day, and he 
hears the music and he hears the partying going on in the house and the first thing that rings in his mind is that somebody forgot to send him an invitation. Friends, if you didn't get invited, don't worry. Hold a party anyway. Amen? Don't worry about it. Completely unimportant. But that young man, that older brother, sorry, he hears the music, he hears the party, he talks to the servants, and then he demands the father come out of the house and speak to him about this situation. Not once, but twice on the same day, the father loves his son enough to leave his house. Not once, but twice. I want you to think about that. And then the brother lays into his son. He lists all the things that his son had been doing, that the other brother had been doing. I wonder how he knew. Had he sent a private investigator to follow the younger brother? But people were twisted, right? We do all sorts of stuff. But that wasn't enough. Oh, you have never slaughtered the fattened calf for me. And I was doing all these things for you. Friends, can I be blunt? Will you not, will you still invite me back again? We are the older brother. We are the older brother. We believe we have the truth. And we do. But when we, choose the tr- when we use the truth to hit people over the head rather than winning them through love, we are the older brother. And we need Jesus in exactly the same way. The father's love was not different for the two sons. He loved both the same. When my daughter comes to me and says, Dad, do you love me? I tell her that she's my favorite daughter. I only have one. (laughs) Amen? That's who God is. Friends, God loves us. Whether we are the younger brother or whether we're the older brother, whatever our situation, whatever the circumstances, whatever we have done, we can always come back to the Father and know that He longs to be united with us. He goes outside of the house to meet us. I think about all the broken people that we know you and I. There are family members. There are people that we work with. There are people that we live in our neighborhoods with. There are people that we associate with in clubs, different things, fitness club, you name it. Bump into them on the street, whatever it is. You and I have an opportunity to help broken people. And not stand there and say, hey, look at me, but to say, look at who I am, how broken I am, and yet Jesus is the one who has resolved my problems. Friends, this is God's plea to you and me. And he says, Luke 31 and 32, the last two verses of the story. He said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad for this, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. We're lost. But God is in the business of finding us. 
He's searching for us. And he has a plan for you and for me. Not just for us to spend eternity with him, but as a plan to share his love, to be a portrait of who he is to everyone around us. So that's who God is. As Christians, we've been called to represent. We've taken his name. We've taken the name of Jesus, and we've accepted and adopted upon ourselves. As you think about your life, how do you reflect the portrait of who God is? How do you reflect that portrait so that others see Jesus through you? God bless you.